Now we're being asked to find the slope of the line by looking at the line. So I'm going to go over there. OK. What you do when you have a graph and you don't have an equation and you're being asked to find the slope is actually you have two choices. Uh, you can find what the point is. This point is 0, 06. And this point is 4, 5. And you could use the slope formula. But that's not really what the writers of the book want you to do. And for this problem, it's not the easiest way. Instead, I'm going to take these two points I know for sure, and it looks like this point is an exact point, so I could take that. And this point looks exact, so I could use that. And this point looks exact, so I could use that. If you didn't have a suggested point, what you want is a point that if you've got grid lines, is exactly on the intersection of two grid lines. So you can make a very good guess about what the slope is. But here they, they actually give us two really easy points. So let's use those points. I'm going to make a triangle. OK, it's a right triangle, so if I wanted to find the distance between these two points, I could use the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, but that's not what we're doing. We are finding slope. Slope, of course, equals, in fact, I should have come over here. Slope equals that, but it also equals rise over run. Where this is the rise and this is the run. And when you do rise over run, you need one more thing. And that is, that is when you're working with a graph on a grid, you also need, also need the direction of tilt. Of. Now, what I mean by that is this. This graph, if you if you were to start on the left and go as far as you can to the right, you would notice immediately that this Y coordinate, whatever that might be, is higher than this Y coordinate. Whatever it is. Looks like 3.5, but I don't know. Okay, that's the important thing. That this point is higher than this point.
When that happens, the point on the left is higher than the point on the right. We say that this, this function, whatever the equation is that made this line, is decreasing. which means the slope is negative. Okay, so now I'm going to measure the rise and measure the run. The rise is just one, goes from five to six or six to five, depending on how you look at it. All right, the rise equals one. The run, on the other hand, is one, two, three, four units long. which means the slope is going to equal one fourth, sort of. Because down here, remember, we said the slope was going to be negative. So the slope, the answer to the problem, is going to be M equals negative one fourth. And that's supposed to be the answer box in my math lab. So one over four and the line is decreasing. Or you might have learned in an earlier class that when the line tilts over to the left, the slope is negative. The college algebra way of looking at, at a negative slope is that it's decreasing. OK, so let's go over. Let me reduce the size on this and see that is the answer. Negative one fourth. Where we had to use rise over run. For this problem. Because we didn't have an equation. Now, on the other hand, you could graph that and then make a triangle if you want, but we're going to use the slope formula because that, would, that is what this problem is made for. So we're going to be using M equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And making this bigger for a minute. I have a reason. I almost always, unless there's some reason not to, I almost always let the point on the left be x1, y1, and the point on the right be x2, y2. So that really, this is just a matter of filling in the numbers. So we're going to have 9 minus 4. Over 3 minus 2. Nine minus 4 is 5. And 3 minus 2 is 1. So the slope is going to be. 5. Make it bigger again. 
So, m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. We're going to be using that a lot today in the next homework set that we're going to work on today. All right, and then it's just a matter of putting in numbers for these symbols right here. And these symbols just mean that x1, y1 is 0.1. and x2, y2 is point 0.2. Okay, if you haven't memorized that yet, make a flashcard. In fact, you might want to keep track of all the formulas so you can make flashcards. We've got y equals mx plus b, slope intercept form, and ax plus by equals c, that standard form, and slope equals rise over run, and slope equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. There are a lot of formulas to remember in math. Aha, so here we go. We're going to do this again. See, the answer is going to be m equals 1. Let's see why. I'll let this be x1, y1, x2, y2. And m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So now watch carefully what I do. y2 is negative 6 then I have to write a minus sign because y2 minus y1. Well, y1 happens to be a negative number. So I put it in parentheses like that. So negative six minus negative three. That can trick you. That can mess you up. So you have to be very, very careful. Meanwhile, x2 minus x1, that'll be 4 minus 7. Let me make sure there's not a minus sign there. No, there isn't. Okay. Now, this is what we're going to have to calculate. If you put this in your calculator, this is a negative sign. This is a minus sign. And this <sighs> No, I can't fit in there. That I'll have to put an arrow. That is a negative sign. Which means I'll have to turn that to negative. Okay. However, it's better, of course, if you don't need a calculator for this, but do take a separate step and write negative six. Whenever you have two negative signs together, you have a plus, and then three. So this is negative six plus three over four minus seven is negative three. Now negative six plus three is negative three. Over negative three, the negatives cancel 
and the threes cancel, leaving you with don't put zero because canceling really means you get one. Three goes into three one time, three goes into three one time. This is a one, positive one. Or you could view it as, all right, negative three over negative three. Any number divided by itself is one. Or if you're unsure, put it in your calculator. Negative sign three divided by negative sign three, enter is positive one. Okay. All right, now we're going, going to do a couple of real life applications. How do you find the slope of a roof? The slope of a roof is called the pitch of the roof and it's given as a percent. So this is going to be two steps. First, we find the slope is a decimal, step one. And step two will be to um, change the decimal to a percent. OK, so the first thing we're going to do is come over here to the picture. And you see that the rise. Is 0.5 feet, half a foot. And the run is seven feet. So that's going to be 0.5. Well, let's write rise over run. Now you get out the calculator. Point five divided by seven, enter. Okay, don't round yet. Don't round, just take this number. Then we're going to multiply it by 100. Don't try to type that number, just leave it there. And type times because this number is now in the memory of the calculator. All you have to do is hit the multiplication key and type 100. The answer multiplied by 100. Okay, there's your answer. Now, that's what you'll be looking at. I am going to take a picture of it. the monster that ate the earth. Let's see how to do this. Okay.
There you go. Now, there are other, or there is more information. Here's where the blue answer box is in my math lab. When you print the sheet off, it becomes a, a space to write the answer, but really it's a box in my math lab. Notice the percent sign is on the outside, so you don't have to write it. Now, there are other instructions round to the nearest percent as needed, and this is always written in blue, so you can't miss it. Please read it. So you'll know how to answer. Round to the nearest percent. That means take off the decimals. So you have to round first. Here's the whole number percent. Look immediately to the right. One is too small to make the seven round up to an eight. So you're just going to drop these decimals off and your answer is going to be seven. So your pitch is 7%. Okay, two steps. First you find the decimal, which we did. Then you change the decimal to a percent. And then you read the instructions, which tells you how many places to round to. OK. Now we've got a graph. Remember, if you don't understand, you can ask me to slow down and or, or slow down and clarify. Clarify means make clear. OK. This says find the rate of change in luxury purchases. That's not your everyday purchase. In a certain country with respect to time. Well, let's just kind of look. Um, clearly, the Y coordinate here is lower than the Y coordinate there, or if you prefer, you can just say the point here is lower than the point there. So this line is increasing. That means luxury purchases are increasing in this problem. All right, I just wanted to throw that in because it gets important later as to whether something is increasing or decreasing. Of course, it's also important here. It means the slope is positive. When something is getting larger, the slope of the line is positive. OK, so we're, we're given two points that in 2008, the amount of luxury purchases, uh, the amount was 8.5. In 2015, the amount was 27.2. So this is actually, th this is an ordered pair, which means it's a point, and this is an ordered pair, which means it's a point. So how should we do this? Well, I'm going to do my, my little self rule here. This is going to be X1, Y1, and this is going to be X2, Y2. And so the slope, which is the rate of change, slope is important because in real life, it shows how fast a change is happening. So M equals 
y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And if you'd like to meet with me for help, please look in syllabus and you'll find my my help hours. Um, a graph that shows um, a graph um, an Excel table that shows when I'm teaching and when I have office hours. And you can just drop by and ask or you can let me know you need a separate time and we'll work it out. I am very available to you. Remember that. OK, so back to work. Y2 minus Y1, that will be 27.2 minus 8.5 over 2015 minus 2008. Well, I know the bottom is seven. I have no idea what the top is though, so I'm going to pull out my trusty calculator and make it temporarily smaller because I need to be able to see this. 27.2 minus 8.5. Now I'll make it bigger again. Okay, 27.2 minus 8.5, and this is a minus sign from up there. I'll hit enter and I get 18.7. So I'll have 18.7 over 7. So I'm going to divide 18.7. I accidentally hit another program. I have 18.7 and I'm going to divide by 7. Because 18.7 is already in the memory, I'll just divide by 7, enter. And this is my answer in a decimal. Now, let's see if they want me to change to a percent. And no, they don't. Because we're talking about billions of dollars a year. Ooh, okay. So let me get this then. There it is. There it is, right here. All right, here's our decimal. And what are we being asked to do? Very important here. What are we being asked to do? The rate of change is about that billion per year. Type an integer or a decimal. An integer is a whole number that's positive. Type an integer or a decimal rounded to two decimal places. That's the information I need. This decimal is going to have to be rounded to two decimal places. One, two. I look immediately to the right, and this one will not cause the seven to round up to an eight. We could write this just in case you don't remember this stuff. So as a result, 
we can drop these off. Goodbye. And our answer will be 2.67. We don't have to write billion because they've already written billion for us. Okay, now this is an important problem. It is kind of a college algebra problem. Because in real life, the most important part of a straight line equation is the slope. Because it tells people in business, it tells people in the sciences, tells people in engineering, well, how fast is this change happening? Sometimes that's the most important thing you can know. So you pull out your computer, which is already set to calculate this, and you find the answer. If you're in business, that might be encouraging, depending on the past. That would tell you whether or not it's positive. I have no idea what it would mean in the sciences. Sciences are different. It might mean something different in chemistry than it, than it means in physics. So you'll have to take the science classes for that. It certainly would have a meaning in, in medicine. I know we have a lot of nursing majors and other allied health majors. Okay. Now we're going to review intercepts. They also are important. Particularly the X intercept, but here we're being asked for both of them. When I printed this out, I printed the answers too. I wanted them on the same page. You really don't see this, okay? You're going to make this in my math lab. All right, so here are the tricks. OK, let me change to black just for a change of pace. Actually, though, I'll stay with blue. The reason I want to do that is then uh, I don't know. It's pretty obvious what my handwriting is. I'll have to debate this for a while, but while I debate, let's find, excuse me, the x-intercept. You always, no matter what that equation is, no matter how complicated it is, the way you find the x-intercept or intercepts is you set y equal to zero and solve for x. So, y equals zero. That means we're going to have x minus three equals zero because that's y, zero. Now solve for the equation, add three to both sides. Negative three plus three is zero, so I'm left with X on the left. On the right of the equal sign, I have zero plus three, which is three. So this tells me that my X intercept is going to be the point Remember, points are made of X and Y coordinates with a comma in the middle. X is three, Y is zero.
now. The y-intercept. You let x equal zero. So now you can't see the equation. What our equation is, is x minus three equals y. If x is zero, we'll have zero minus three equals y. So negative three is what y equals. So the y-intercept, here's x, here's y. We're letting x equals zero. So when x equals zero, y equals negative three. And so now you have your two points. All you have to do is go to my math lab and graph the line. And in real life, in, in any math class you've ever had, the way you graph a straight line is all you need is two points. Now, some teachers make you find a third point. That's just to make sure. But here's the point three zero right here. Here's the point zero, negative three. So you would graph one of these points and then click on the other point and in my math lab, boom, you've got a line. It's not so boom if you're doing it on paper. Yeah, you've got to actually draw the line. You plot the points and then draw the line if you're doing a test on paper. So in some ways, doing it on my math lab is much easier. Probably time for me to save. Okay, now we're gonna talk about another method of graphing. And in some ways, this is easier because you don't have to go to all this trouble to find the intercepts. Instead, you can just do this in one fell swoop, especially when you, um, when you have the line in slope intercept form, you already see what the slope and the y intercept is. So what you do is you are two step process. Well, actually, it's a three step process. Step one. Start at B. Now, I didn't make that clear. Plot B. In this problem, B is eight. So what I would do is I would come over here to the graph and I would put a great big dot on eight. Then, stop that. My computers like to harass me sometimes. I hope you got my note yesterday that I'm having lots of trouble with my NWAC email. So I'm going to be contacting you when I contact you, either by Canvas or by Success Planner. Uh, I use Success Planner when I want to send a message to all my students. 
sometimes. Sometimes I just do it in Canvas. You never know. But Canvas or Success Planner is how I'm going to be contacting you because right now my email in my in in NWAC, my NWAC email is all messed up. There are I don't know anybody else who has the same problems I do. Probably your NWAC email is just fine. Oh, I've got so many problems. Okay. Steps two and three. I'm going to move that over a little bit. We're going to use the slope. as a roadmap. That's the way I think of it. So that means we have to discuss slope in more detail. Slope, we already said equals the rise over the run. But what does that mean? What that means is vertical movement. Or vertical change. over horizontal change. Okay. Change, what change, what change? Well, first, if you take any higher level math classes, vertical change is called that. Horizontal change is called that. I just think that's very interesting. Triangle means change in math and in chemistry. This means change in vertical position This must be important if I'm spending this much time. over divided by the change in the horizontal position. Okay, so let us apply that. Well, actually, let's let's go put that in the steps then. Okay, step two. Move. Move from B. Remember, you plotted B. Now you move away from B 
in the number of units indicated by the numerator of the fraction. Because slope is always really a fraction. Okay, move from B. Let me put B in parentheses there. Move from B in the number of units indicated by the numerator. That's the top of the fraction. So I'll even be explicit. I'll say the numerator top of the slope. Then three, move in the direction, don't put a dot. I should say that, don't put a dot. Don't Don't put a dot. Then from step two, move in the direction indicated by the denominator, the bottom. the denominator, yeah, which is the bottom. Of the slope. All right, now I'm going to write step four out here because there's no room. Step four. Put a dot. And that should be capitalized, shouldn't it? Then I guess there's a step five, draw a line. Series of steps are really good for flashcards too, but you have to read them at least once a day. All right, well, that's what happened here. All right, so let's write this stuff down. The y-intercept is eight. Eight on the y-axis. Now, the slope, I want to write it up here, slope. I think it's nine sevenths, but I'm going to go back and look. Nine sevenths. Now, 
Nine is a positive number. Seven is a positive number. Positive nine mo means move up nine units. Positive seven means move to the right seven units and then put a dot. That's what we're going to do. So I need to move up nine units, and to do that, I have to figure out the scale. So this is 10, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. So what that means is that, let's see, there are, this goes up by twos. So let me put the one in there, you know. So eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. I do that because I have to go in units. Same here, this is two. Four, six, eight. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, now I'm ready. Here we go. I start at eight. I move up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine steps units, and then I go, notice I didn't put a dot, no dot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, seven. Now I put the dot. And now that I have two dots, I can draw a line between them. Save it, check answer, and my math lab tells you how smart you are. Actually, it has nothing to do with smart. It just has to do with learning a technique. With practice, anybody can do this. All right, it is 9.03 and we've been here for an hour. Why don't you take a break until 9.15? Uh, go ahead and restart your computers if you have a computer that crashes a lot. And uh, we'll come back in, yeah, a little over 10 minutes. This will give you a chance to get up, move around, get some coffee, which is precisely what I plan to do, and then we will continue. Bye temporarily. So here we go. This is the same kind of problem. And this time we're going to go through it. I'm not going to go through it real fast, but I'm not going to do all that writing either because I did it in the last one. Coffee. That's what I did during the break. I made myself some more coffee. Buzz, buzz, buzz. OK, we are now going to graph this by using the slope and the y-intercept. That means for this standard form equation, we're going to have to find, we're, we're going to have to put it in slope-intercept form first. OK, so. Nope, nope. OK. There. We've got 3x plus, uh, 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 that's a minus. Well, but, hey, wait a minute. Plus negative 2y equals 6. That's really a good way to think about this. 
because remember that numbers take the sign in front of them. Well, the reason I'm doing this is one, I had a I had a dash there and I got to cover it up. But two, watch what happens when I do this. Three X minus three X is zero plus negative two Y, I bring down the negative two Y. And it makes dealing with that negative sign a lot easier. Negative three X and six is positive, so plus six. Then I divide by negative two, and I divide by negative two, and I divide by negative two. The negatives cancel, the twos cancel. I'm left with a Y. Negative three over negative two is positive three over two, or you can think of it as the negative signs canceling. But the negative signs are not gonna cancel there because you have a positive over a negative. So this is going to be minus six divided by two, which is three. All right, this is the slope intercept version of this line right there. I'll even make a, an arrow. So what does this mean? This means that the y-intercept is zero, negative three, and the slope is three over two. Notice it's a positive three over a positive two. We're going to go up three and to the right two. So now, now. You start at the y-intercept, negative three. So negative one, negative two, negative three, and you put a big old dot. Then, we go up three and to the right two. So one, two, three, one, two, and then put a dot. Do not put a dot halfway. You have to complete the up and the over first. Now that you've done that, if you're doing it on paper, you draw a line. If you're doing it on my math lab, the line is already automatically drawn for you. Okay, now that is, is you see it's pretty quick. You don't have to calculate you don't have to calculate intercepts or any other points. All you have to do is use the intercepts. <coughs> That's not going to be true for the lines that follow. These are the weird lines that only have one variable. Okay, fine, be that way. There. We have to graph this, and there is a method, a no-fail method that will let you graph that. Here it is. Remember making X and Y charts. We're go going to do that. The thing is, that since there's only one variable, x, that means x is negative four, 
no matter what y equals. Y can be anything because there's nothing telling you what y has to equal. X on the other hand is stuck on negative four. So suppose I let y equal zero and suppose I let y equal six. Now I'm going to plot those two points. I come out to negative four and the y, the y coordinate is zero, so I don't go up or down to plot a point. So there's my first point because I chose it. I didn't have to. I can make y anything I want. Now six was convenient because it's already marked. So I, the point negative four, six, I get to that by starting in the center, going to the left four and up six. So I'll plot that point. Now that I have my two points plotted, I can connect them with a straight line. Again, if you do this in my math lab, by the time you click on the second point, you've automatically got a line. But doing it on paper, you have to draw your own line. And that's how you would do that. It's important to note two things. Here's more review. That whenever you have X equals a number, that means it's going to be a vertical line forgot that again, a vertical line. Okay, and what else did you learn? Did you remember? The slope of all vertical lines is undefined. These are just a few other miscellaneous facts from the past. Okay. Now, y equals three, only one letter. We do this, we use the same method for graphing. Make an X and a Y chart. You need two points. Y is being held at three. There is no X here, so you can just make X any old number you want to. But Y has got to be three. Three and three. So now, um, suppose I'm just gonna use the first number to pop in my head, negative five. For no reason. And how about positive seven? for no particular reason, they just popped in my head. Okay, now I'm going to graph these two points, negative five, three, and seven, three. Okay, negative five, three, I start in the center, I go five units to the left to negative five, and then up three, one, two, three, and put a dot. Now to graph seven, three, to plot seven, three, I start at the center. I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven units to the right. Do not put a dot yet because you have to now go up three, one, two, three, and put a dot. In my math lab, by the time you click on the second dot, your line is already made, but by hand, you have to make your own line, draw your own line. Okay. 
Now, I'm going to switch back and save. All right, now, do we have any questions about anything covered so far? No, you do a, you do a good do. job of explaining everything. Well, thank you. How nice of you. Um, we're about to do something that's college algebra E. Is that an adjective? This is slope. This ugly looking guy right here, or girl, or whatever, ugly looking being is slope. But this form of the slope is called the difference quotient. And it's used uh, a lot in math, especially in higher level math. Um, we're going to start off with baby steps. And we're going to use this later, but not now. No, we are going to use baby steps right now. And we are going to find the difference quotient of this function right here. And you're going to find that this one is pretty easy. In fact, you can see the answer. But I want you to learn the steps so that you already know the steps when you start using a harder function like that one. I had to throw in something a little hard. It's in my math teacher heart. What can I say? All right, so let's do this problem first because it's easy and you get to see the steps. There are four steps. Step one. Well, you know what f of x is, but write it kind of big. There's a reason. Step two. Now, here's the new step. F of X plus H. We've got to find out what that is. So here I go. Whatever I put in here, make that red. Whatever I put in here, has to go in for the X. So F of X plus H means I'm going to take X plus H and put it in there. So equals six parentheses X plus H. And then don't forget to bring down the minus seven. It was already there. Now, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to um, um, distribute, which is just another word for multipl multiplication. Six times X and six times H. So I will have six X plus six 
h minus 7. And now I know what f of x plus h is. Okay, pretty straightforward so far. Step three. Notice I'm going to erase my circle there. And now, what I need to do is find out what f of x plus h minus f of x is. It's not as hard as it seems, but it's not easy either. Not when you're dealing with more complicated things. Here, it's not going to be bad. Okay. So, step three. We need to find f of x plus h. and subtract f of x. Okay, I'm gonna do it. I look up here, f of x plus h is 6x plus 6h minus 7 minus f of x is 6x minus 7. Okay. Well, that gives me 6x plus 6h minus 7. Now, here's the tricky part. You treat that minus sign as though it were a negative one. Negative one times positive 6x is negative or minus 6x. Negative times negative seven is going to be plus seven. And now that's what I've got. Now I combine like terms. Remember that? Yeah, all this is, all this was, all this ended up being, <clears throat> excuse me, was polynomial subtraction. Remember that? You studied polynomials in beginning algebra and a little bit in intermediate algebra. And one of the things you had to do was just subtract one polynomial from another. Both of these guys are polynomials. <gasps> And I should tell you what H is. H is a number. H is a little number. Usually it's like 0 0.000003 or something like that. You don't want to write that. Now, so we just call it H. Now, I'm going to combine like terms. 6x and 6x are like terms. I have 6x minus 6x. Well, that gives me zero. I have minus seven or negative seven plus seven. Negative seven plus seven is zero. So what I'm left with is just 6h. So that's what f of x plus h minus f of x, that's what it equals. That's what the numerator of this fraction equals. So step four is to figure out what the whole difference quotient is now that we've taken it apart. 
step four, we're going to find f of x plus h. <laughs> x plus h minus f of x over h. This is the difference quotient. All right, we know that f of x plus h minus f of x is 6h. If we put that over h, The H's cancel, and you're left with 6, which of course it would be 6, because here all you're doing is you're dealing with Y equals 6X minus 7, where 6 is the slope of the line. And this is slope. So all you have to do is master these steps. Step one, write out f of x bigger so that you can write f of x plus h and you can see that you have stuck the X plus H where the X was. It's less confusing that way. Then all you do is you distribute and you have um, uh, what F of X plus H equals. Then you have to calculate, well, what is F of X plus H minus F of X? and you work that out. And for this problem, you found it equals this. Then the last step, step four, is to find the whole difference quotient. F of X plus H over F of X. No, F of X plus H minus F of X all over H. And we found out the answer is, yep, it's the slope because the difference quotient is the slope. And remember, slope is rate of change, and that's really why you're doing it. How fast is change happening? In whatever area you can apply that to. In medicine, it could be um, how long does it take the COVID-19 vaccine to give full immunity or 95% immunity. Now here we have something that's not a line. OK. And let's graph this just so you'll have a mental image. I'm going to start out small, then make it big. Again, I do that. Because. I need to be able to read that, so negative 9 X squared plus 2x plus 9. Now I'll make it big. Negative 9x squared, and to get that little 2 up there, you have a special button over here to do it. Plus 2x, and you always get your x's from this button right here. The weird looking button. Okay, so I wrote that out. Now I'm going to graph it. It's 
set it. That's right. That's it. It's a cup down parabola. We call this a parabola. It's important to say that this is not a sharp point, okay? Just be aware of that. So I'm going to make it fatter so you can see it's not. Yeah. Now that's not a straight line. How can we find the slope? Good to tell ya. So let's kind of sort of draw it here. And I didn't draw that right, so I'm going to erase it and try again. No, not a straight line. It should be tilted out, doggone it, like that. There. That's our graph, sort of blown up. Okay, it's not a straight line. How can I find the slope? Here's how. If, if this is the x-axis, let's just say it is. Then I want to find two points on the x-axis. They can be anywhere, but I want them really close together. How about these two points on the x-axis? Well, let's see. If I go up to the graph, that'll give me this point right there. And if I go up to the graph, it'll give me this point right there. And then I want to draw a straight line between them. There. If I can find the slope of that line, then I can find how quickly whatever this measures is changing. Okay. So that's why. You see, that this is really why we would use this. You wouldn't use it for a straight line, especially when all you have to do is look at the straight line, if it's in slope-intercept form, and see what the slope is. Why would you go to all this trouble? And the answer is to learn the steps so that you can apply it to something more complicated. We need the slope of this line so that we can get the rate of change. So, what the difference quotient is going to give us is the slope of, We're going to call it the tangent line, but it's not really the tangent line. If you ever take calculus, it's called the secant line. The object is to make it into the tangent line, but we're not going to go into that here. But it's a line. It's a line that connects two points on a graph. Those points are really close together and you want to find out what the slope of the line is that connects those two points so you can calculate um, a rate of change for whatever it is you're working on, either a cure for COVID-19 or building a bridge, how fast are, are the uh, uh, metals going to expand in the summertime, um, things like that really important things. I mean, you don't want to be on a bridge that collapses. 
So it's important to find out what that change is. So we're going to do it using those four steps. F of X, now I'm going to write this big. Uh -huh. Well, you know, running down a little bit. F of X plus H equals, oh, that's the answer, negative 9X squared, <clears throat> negative 9X squared plus 2X plus 9. Okay? Then step 2, we're going to find F of X plus H, which is going to be negative 9 times x plus h squared plus 2 times x plus h plus 9. Okay, that would be the first step in, well, the first step in finding x plus h, but it would be step 2. Let's number these. Step one, whoop, step two. Now this one is a little more complicated than the previous problem. For instance, x plus h squared is x plus h times x plus h. Meanwhile, we can distribute here 2 times x, 2 times h. This will be plus 2x plus 2h plus 9. Okay, now, very carefully multiply this binomial by this binomial. I'm going to make arrows to help you remember how to do it. This x multiplies the first term in the second set of parentheses and the second term in the second set of parentheses, like that. So you're going to have x times x plus x times h. Then, This plus H multiplies the X and the H so that you're going to have H times X plus H times H. And if you go real slowly, it'll all be okay. X times x is x squared. x times h is written with the h in front because h is a number. Then plus h times positive x is plus hx. And then plus h times plus h is plus h squared. And we lived through it to tell our children and grandchildren.
and we're done with that step. Now there's a rule in math that's very helpful. And what it says is that inside the parentheses, if you have like terms, you need to combine them. I have like terms. HX plus HX. That means I have two HXs. Two HX terms. So I'm going to take an extra step and do this. Why? Why couldn't I just say minus 9HX minus 9HX? You could, but you're just less likely to make a mistake if you stay very orderly. So I'm going to have two of these guys. And then I have the plus H squared. Meanwhile, don't forget these. Plus 2X plus 2H plus 9. Now I'm ready to distribute the negative 9. I've got a number in front of parentheses. I have three terms inside the parentheses the negative 9 has to multiply each of these terms. So negative 9 times x squared is negative 9x squared. And negative 9 times positive 2hx is going to be negative 18hx because negative nine times positive two is negative 18. Okay, and negative nine times positive H squared is going to be negative or minus nine H squared. And then I write the rest of it, plus two X plus two H plus nine. And that ugly beastie is what f of x plus h equals. Notice you, this begs for arithmetic errors, which is why you have to slow down. Even if you're really, really good at math, slow down. OK. Now, step three is out there waiting for us. I need to find F of X plus H minus F of X. See, I'm making myself lots of room here. All right, I have to carefully copy this and try to not make any sign errors. Let me move that up. It's easier for you to see and it's easier for my hand to write. Except, there. Negative 9x squared minus 8 hx minus 9h squared plus 2x plus 2h plus 9. That's f of x plus h minus parentheses, negative 9x squared plus 2x plus 9. Okay. 
Now again, I'm going to be very organized by what I do. This is negative 9x squared minus 18hx minus 9h squared plus 2x plus 2h plus 9. You have to distribute that minus sign to every term in the parentheses. Pretend it's a negative one. If that's a negative one, you would have negative one times negative nine X squared. That would be positive nine X squared. And negative one times positive two X would be negative or minus 2x. Negative 1 times positive 9 would be negative 9 or minus 9. We're done with the hardest part of this. <gasps> now all I have to do is combine like terms. You can still make a mistake there because with all this gobbledygook here, it's hard to see. So you have to still be careful. Well, negative 9x squared and 9x squared are like terms. Negative 9x squared plus 9x squared is 0. Two X and minus two X are zero. Nine and minus nine are zero. What am I left with? That can be hard to see also. Let's see, I have negative 18 HX negative or minus 9h squared. And there's this 2h. And that is all I have left. So, huh, f of x plus h minus f of x equals negative 18hx, minus 9h squared. Ooh, that's ugly. Neg minus 9h squared plus 2h. One more step. f of x plus h minus f of x over h. We know what this is now. Negative 18 h x minus 9 h squared plus to h, and I divide all three terms, everything here, by h. Divide by h, divide by h, divide by h. A trick I've learned over time. Remember that h squared is h times h. I'm going to write h squared here as h times h because it makes canceling the h easier because that's your next step. You cancel the h's, you cancel the h's, you cancel the h's, and your final answer 
Ta -da! is negative 18 X minus 9 H plus 2. Let's see if that's right. Yes. This is not easy. You have to be very, very careful. The most dangerous step is right here, parentheses x plus h squared. You have to you have to write out x plus h times x plus h and then multiply the two binomials the way I did it here, or use the FOIL method, but what I did was the FOIL method. It just doesn't look like the FOIL method, but it is. 